Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Tiffany Garcia and I'm an Education and Programming Services Librarian at the San Jose Public Library. Today we have Pamela, a Master Gardener, and Jill, another Master Gardener, who will be supporting Pamela during this program. And now I'll pass the spotlight to Pamela. So I'd just like to start with an introduction. Um, I'm a Master Gardener and Jill, who's helping me and who's going to be in the chat today, is also a Master Gardener. We are University of California trained uh, volunteers. Um, we, uh, most, most of the counties um, in California, and in fact, most counties in most states have some sort of master gardener program. Um, we did have our new classes suspended because of COVID, but we are actually hoping to resume for the 2023 class. So if you think you might be interested in being a master gardener, keep an eye out around January, 2022 um, for information on how to do so. Um, master gardeners volunteer many hours every year in many capacities to help the public. And we also receive ongoing training to stay on top of science. So I really encourage you to sign up for our tips and events um, to be notified about other talks that we'll be doing all over as many of these will be online and you can do them from the convenience of your house with your slippers on and everything. Um, we do have a number of our um, ongoing activities that have been suspended for um, COVID. So the county office is closed, for example. So master gardeners run the help desk from home. Um, so email is usually the best way to reach us, but we also really like supporting pictures. Um, that uh, help uh, help us to or help us to understand what it is that you need help with. Um, so I encourage you to to check that out. Um, and um, we hope to resume our spring garden market, fall garden market type um, events soon. Uh, many of our demo gardens are open to the public. They're not fenced in. They're not closed. Um, so you can check out the info on our demo gardens and potentially go and visit them. So the first thing I'd really like is for you to tell me um, what brought you here today. Um, what, type, what type of citrus are you growing and where are you growing it? Is it in the ground, in a pot? Are you researching today before you dive in to get some citrus? Um, I would love to know. I would love for you to, to type it into the chat and tell me more about it. move my chat window now out of the way for you so I can see ooh, mm -hmm, what everybody else is saying. Awesome. Great, and while some of you are still writing me messages to tell me more about it, I'll just uh, point out that the picture in the background is actually um, a flying dragon um, citrus plant. Um, it is often used as rootstock. It doesn't grow quite so awesome and curly when uh, the rootstock is, uh, is present with another scion on it, but um, when it's by itself, it's a really cool plant. So um, that's what that is. Great, lots of feedback. Well, great, I'm so glad that so many of you are so interested in citrus and have such a variety um, going on. So I'm just gonna keep going. And, uh, yeah, oops. and talk a little bit about, the, here's sort of an overview of what I intend to talk about today. Um, some of the varieties, there are so many, we could probably spend a whole hour on that. So I'm gonna cover that briefly selecting a tree, planting a tree, watering, 
pruning, fertilizing, um, pests and diseases. I'm sure some of you, that's exactly what you came for today. So I intend to cover that and to make sure that I answer as many of your questions as possible. So Jill's going to help um, uh, answering questions. And I just wanted to say too, I'm sure we're going to be able to fill up this time with uh, citrus questions. So if you do have another type of question you'd really like to ask the master, master gardener, please feel free to send the help desk your questions because those of us who do the talks are also among the crew that answer those questions. Um, and uh, we'd love to, to see those there as well. So um, citrus is a fantastic tree. It's gorgeous in the landscape. It's evergreen. It has this glossy dark green foliage. It's, um, it's beautiful all year round. You can actually grow it as a tree, as a shrub, or even as a hedge um, if you put the trees about five feet apart. And you can even espalier uh, lemons usually on those are the easiest because those are the most vigorous growers, but um, you can't do it with lots. But I also know that many of us do not have large spaces. We don't have permanent spaces or sun in the right place to plant a tree. There are a number of reasons we can't just throw a tree in the ground. So citrus performs remarkably well as a potted tree. And those glossy green leaves can really spice up a concrete patio or balcony. There are a few differences between raising citrus in a pot versus the ground. And where that's relevant, I'm going to mention those as I go. So actually, when you see my slide have kind of an orange background, it's, I really want those of you with potted citrus to pay attention to um, a detail there. So there are so many varieties of citrus, um, I couldn't even possibly cover them all. Um, many of us are <laughs> clearly fond of lemons, um, both Eureka and Meyer lemon, um, the Meyer lemon being sort of a sweeter, um, smaller fruit with a thinner rind, slightly different flavor, great for dessert. Um, and that there's a variety of other things that that um, people really enjoy the Eureka lemon, the Lisbon lemon, there's the variegated pink lemon. Um, there are so many, there's so many varieties of oranges and many, many, many hybrids. Um, I could not possibly cover them all, but I would like to show you a resource in which you could learn more about the varieties that happen to be available for uh, growing in Santa Clara County. Now, this is one, Four Winds is one of the um, citrus growers that we have in the Valley, but the reason why I'm pointing you here is because their website actually has like a list of everything they've ever raised for sale in Santa Clara County. So. Starting with sweet oranges, you can see that there's a number of varieties. And when you're looking for information about what's right for your yard, um, you can find out about the size, you can find about when they bloom, when the fruit comes around, so that you might want to choose multiple citrus according to, you know, having uh, year round citrus, or maybe you want a bonanza and you want it all one type of the year. Um, how much heat it might need for the fruit to be sweet and really important because we never know what the winter is going to be like here in California um, when the tree needs to be protected from cold or frost. I am not going to talk about indoor citrus growing today because that is practically another topic all on its own. And citrus really, really, really wants several hours, five to six hours or more of direct sunlight. And most of us can't make that happen inside. So that is one topic I'm gonna leave off today. Um, but um, there are a number of um, categories of um, limes and oranges and mandarins and um, grapefruits and kumquats and and there's some really fun stuff here um this is becoming really popular you can buy the rootstock if you'd like to have a frying flying dragon um as an ornamental plant why not um but there's yuzu lemons um australian finger limes um the the citron or ethrog i'm not actually actually sure how you pronounce that um but that that goes way back that's that's um that's an old one Buddha's hand is one of my favorites. It is, it doesn't really have flesh or juice inside. Um, it looks 
like a weird finger thing. If you come back to this picture right here, you can see it over here. And Buddha's hand is really awesome for slicing and turning into a citrus candy. Um, there are so many. My, my strongest advice would be to check out all the varieties of citrus that exist, um, to check out Emma Prush, um, uh, which is uh, off of 280. They have a citrus demo garden. It's worth checking out this summer. You can see what the trees look like that when they're a few years old and you can see what the fruit looks like that's developing on them. I'd ask your friends and neighbors for variety recommendations or varieties to avoid something they didn't like. And if you find something you like the taste of at the farmer's market, ask them. Unlike the grocery store, you're actually likely to find out what variety of um, citrus someone might be um, bringing to the market. So that's my favorite place to get information about uh, new stuff. So I just want to cover, you know, the basics. Citrus needs sun. Like I mentioned, about five to six hours of sunlight. Um, some varieties will need more heat for the fruit to sweeten. Um, for example, uh, my Moro blood orange really likes to be next to the stucco house because it really likes that extra heat. Um, they like water, <laughs> um, but they don't want water near their trunk and they feel very strongly that they don't want their feet to be wet. So citrus wants to be watered thoroughly and then to be allowed to, for things to dry out before they get watered again. Um, and sometimes we need to protect the trunk from sunburn um, with some painting. Um, and I will mention that again. Um, and, uh, and then we have to protect them sometimes from the lack of sun um, when winter comes around. And that's something I'll talk about as well. But let's first talk about picking a tree. When you are selecting a new tree, here's a couple things to look for. Buy locally from a reputable nursery or store. I know some of you probably have picked something up at Costco seasonally. That's okay. That stuff is being raised locally. Um, start with small trees in small containers. A trunk size of about a half an inch in diameter is ideal. Make sure the variety you select will be suitable for where you are. Even within our county, we have some differences between um, the average winter nighttime temps. Um, and uh, you also have to think about what's the appropriate size tree for your garden. Trees do come in dwarf, semi-dwarf, and standard, although true dwarf trees are really hard to find these days. That's, that's usually on the flying dragon stock, and it's really hard to find. Semi-dwarf is most common for a pot or even a small space in the ground, like a residential backyard, when you're talking about a tree where you can harvest most or all of the fruit without needing a ladder or a fruit picker. Um, and so that's why you're going to find mostly semi-dwarf trees in the, um, uh, in the stores these days. Try to buy trees that are in small containers with healthy leaves and no fruit. Um, considering the really increased demand for citrus under quarantine, you're not likely to find one that's been in the same pot for too long. But you do want to avoid buying a root-bound tree, which is when the tree's roots have really run out of room and they're making really tight circles around inside the pot. If you tip the pot and gently slide the tree out by the trunk and the stake it's attached to, just get a really firm grip close to the, to the soil level, you can see the roots for yourself before you buy the tree without harming it. Um, and if you're buying for permanent placement in a pot, given the choice of a tree with a compact multi-branch shape versus one with a few vigorous branches, you'll want the one that will require less pruning to stay rounder. But in the ground, this really isn't going to matter. The tree is going to you know, create a, a beautiful round shape in short order, but you would prefer not to prune um, a potted tree more than necessary. And then if you did find a tree with some fruit on it, we would recommend removing that fruit before you plant it because being transplanted is a pretty stressful, um, st stressful event. Okay, so then I want to talk about rootstock. There's that flying dragon. Um, this is a rootstock that is um, uh, used to control for size. Our citrus trees are typically grafted to rootstock to protect against disease or to control for size. Um, Many older trees are on something called rough lemon. Um, this is a rootstock that is not commonly used now, but when somebody contacts us about a beautiful old tree that has started to make these bumpy lemons that aren't very juicy, the rootstock is often taking over. 
trees that are very old, as in 40 to 50 years old, trees that have experienced neglect, for example, a sucker that was allowed to grow or prune very hard can experience this. Um, and newer trees, especially semi-dwarf, they're often on C35, which is a hybrid of that um, flying dragon trifoliate orange. Um, you see that thorn, that's two inch thorn there, um, vigorous branching. Um, I see this all the time and it even happened to one of my trees. Um, when you have this diminutive little tree and it suddenly takes off with this vertical branch with two inch thorns, you, what you're seeing is the rootstock is taking control of the ship. And I will totally talk about this more when we get to the section on pruning, but I just wanted you to recognize lemons tend to be the most thorny of the trees, but still lemon thorns are usually sharp and maybe a half inch long. And when we're talking about two inches, then we're talking about that, that rootstock. Okay. And then spring. Early spring is the best time to plant new citrus. Avoid the intense heat of summer that limits the stress to the tree. But some of you are gonna be like, you're gonna plant the tree whenever you can find the tree if you're looking for something new. Um, so let's just talk about in general, um, uh, tree planting. Take a good look at your tree before you plant it. Look at the trunk, identify the bud union, um, the slightly swollen area where the rootstock and the scion were grafted together. Notice if there are any roots of your tree that are above the level of the soil in the pot. Um, we want to make sure that the tree ends up in the ground at the same height or a tiny bit higher. Dig the hole as deep as the root ball and twice the diameter. And yes, you can slide the tree partially out of the pot to take a look and see what the root ball size is before you dig. Um, just handle it gently. And of course, this is another advantage of choosing a smaller tree at the nursery. So you've got a smaller hole and a smaller tree to try to get in the right spot. Keep the top of the root ball uh, one inch above the soil surface. In other words, if any roots were above ground in the pot, maintain that height in the ground. Tamp some loose soil around the tree. You can leave the stake that was on the tree, most of the time that's, that's there in the nursery, um, until you see new growth or signs that it's settling in if you like. And if you live somewhere where you've got a lot of wind, you can consider staking your tree properly for the first year or two. I did have a pot of citrus that once blew over in the wind um, and uh, it did cause a little damage to the branches of my tree. So, you know, that's, um, that's something to think about if you live in a really windy area. We don't recommend um, adding amendments or fertilizer at planting. Our native clay soil is best as long as drainage is good. Citrus really actually likes it. So if you have concerns about that or generally want to improve the health of the soil around your new tree, consider using compost as mulch, staying six to 12 inches away from the trunk of the tree and adding a little more every time you notice what you put there previously has incorporated itself into the soil. If you have no concerns, feel free still to use compost as mulch as if you like, but you can also use, you know, um, wood chips or colored mulch or whatever you feel like. It would be recommended to fertilize after about a month or so after transplanting into its new space when the tree looks settled and new growth can be seen instead of right away. And we do not recommend pruning at planting unless there's a branch that's dead or broken. So just take the fruit off and then leave the tree alone for a little while. But let's talk about planting in a pot. <laughs> dwarf and semi-dwarf trees um, do really well in pots, though potted citrus needs a lot more attention. This is most of my citrus, so I have to baby it. Um, citrus will need to be repotted every two or three years if you intend to keep it in the same size pot, unless the pot is very large. There's a very large pot. Good luck repotting once your tree's grown into a pot that size. Um, but if you're working with something smaller, I have 25 gallon, 30 gallon pots. I gently wiggle the tree out. I use my fingers with gloves on and just kind of wiggle them in there to knock off some of the soil beyond the root ball, loosen things up. I refresh at least 50% of the soil mixture. Um, and then early spring to early summer are okay for repotting. But um, it's possible that if you wait beyond that, you're gonna knock off some not yet ripe fruit. Um, that's just sort of the trade off. Um, if your tree is really unhappy, you might go for that anyways. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what pot you might want to put things in. Catalogs are always showing this Mediterranean fancy formal garden with trees and terracotta pots. 
but terracotta is not actually the most ideal because it can really lose a lot of moisture, not just from the bottom, but the sides of the pot. Of course, you have lots of choices. If you want to go for a terracotta pot, you might just want to think about bigger. Um, you can also choose half wine barrels, glazed ceramics, even that molded foam that looks like terracotta. Um, and my favorite, honestly, I've had the most success with has been plastic. I found insulated plastic pots way back at Osh that were like a sunset, you know, summer special. And my trees have been really happy in that space. You can put a piece of metal screen in the bottom to keep your soil mix from falling out the bottom, but don't put gravel or anything else in the bottom of the pot. That's sort of a myth about drainage. Um, pot feet or, you know, something like that to keep the bottom off the pot from making direct contact with the hot surface, like your concrete patio. That is actually helpful. Um, citrus really don't like their feet to be wet. So here's a here's a pot. Um, so consider uh, that drainage, not just underneath, but um, use a well-draining potting mix. Um, for this cactus mix is great. It's often sold as cactus, palm, and citrus mix on the bags. Um, citrus and pop can be really dramatic about being thirsty too. Um, and instability and watering can really stress the trees and they can have an effect on your fruit, both your harvest and sort of what the, um, uh, what the rind is like. So I found in my experience, I'm um, using cactus mix plus some finished compost on top, thinking, you know, same level that um, it would have been um, if I was just using the potting mix as far as height, um, can help to absorb the moisture when I hand water and release it slowly without the tree sort of getting waterlogged. Um, mostly the, they don't get waterlogged from being watered. They get it from our really rainy winters. Um, I just, Joey, I'm gonna answer your question right now. Would a tree in a huge container grow to be as big as the tree in the ground? Depending on the containers, yes. Absolutely. If you put a semi-dwarf tree in one of those pots, like the, the, the one that guy was standing next to, you can often end up with a tree that um, might have been the same thing as the same size as something you put in the corner of your yard. Um, so some people do use pots because they want, um, they just want to contain the tree or they just want to raise the height of the tree above other plantings or they can't put something that deep in the ground, um, but they have every intention of the tree staying put where it is. And sometimes the, the tree roots just get really strong and they literally knock out the bottom of the pot. So then the tree ends up in the ground, but you know, that's okay. Um, you do get that Mediterranean look when you do that. So I definitely recommend, um, most of the time when you're buying your citrus, you're buying something that's probably a five gallon pot. Um, so you want to look for something that, um, if you want to like up pot along the way, you could start with 10 to 15. Um, but if you want to keep it in the same pot for a long time um, and you want something decorative, I would go for something closer to 25 or 30 gallons. That, that would be my recommendation. And let's talk about watering. Your tree does not really want the trunk to get wet. When you have a potted citrus, that will be somewhat unavoidable, um, but the water should um, drain away. When you have a new tree in the ground, you are free to take some um, mulch or soil around it and sort of create um, a bit of a moat to help the um, ground, um, or the, you know, the ground absorb water where you want it to go. But since our native soil absorbs water at roughly, this is math, about half a gallon per hour, watering your tree low and slow is the way to go. So you don't necessarily have to create a moat like that um, in order to get the water there, just water slow. <laughs> you could use soaker hose, you could use drip hose, that kind of thing. Um, but um, the slower it is, the more likely it's gonna stay right there where the roots of the tree need it. Um, younger trees are going to require more watering um, than once a week, probably two to five gallons each time. Mature trees often only require watering twice a month in hot water and once, or hot weather, excuse me, and once a month um, the rest of the year. Um, for mature trees in the ground, be sure that you've seen that the top of the, the ground near the tree has had a chance to dry out before um, watering again. So uh, as you start thinking about your big tree, 
you know, you, it becomes easier and easier to water away from the trunk because most of the most of the water should be where the canopy drip line is, which means look at the width of your tree, look where it falls and put most of the moisture in the ground right around that that circle that uh, um, around your tree. So water it there. Um, I, what, however you water it, hand water it, or um, some people run a soaker hose and they just adjust the, the shape or a drip line um, and run it around um, where the, the drip line is and just adjust it as the tree gets bigger. But when you're watering potted citrus, it's a little different. Um, you're actually gonna lose some of the nutrition out of the bottom of the pot when you water. So um, you are going to wanna think about um, watering and fertilizing um, a little bit more carefully. Potted citrus can be, we joke that my trees are drama queens and they will literally, they will wilt as much as a basil wilts when they are in need of water. Ideally, you want to give them water before they get to that point. Um, though, you know, even master gardeners forget sometimes. Um, so, so get out there and, you know, take a look at your tree and um, oftentimes I'll make a schedule that says, oh, I'm going to water it Tuesday when I put the trash cans out and then once over the weekend, something like that. Um, I would like to talk briefly about um, inline drip. That's the picture on the right. If you look at the um, left-hand side, you'll actually see um, you'll see a healthy tree <laughs> um, and you'll see a couple curled up leaves. There's a little bit of cupping there. I would describe that as what, you, when you start seeing some of that cupping in either direction, um, that's a great time to say, oh, I need to water my tree again. Um, and then I just wanna put a plug in there for inline drip. Um, if you have a tree in the ground or you would like to water the tree, um, water your potted citrus a little more reliably, particularly if you have a big pot um, or you go on vacation or something like that. Um, I definitely recommend um, considering what we call a tree ring irrigation um, circle, um, a trick, T-R-I-C, and you can look that up. Um, Jill might even be able to put a link to it um, in the chat um, because there's some info from UC Davis on it. and. Um, that is a great way to um, get that water low and slow where you need it and be able to walk away. Let's talk about pruning citrus. Um, <laughs> potting citrus is cranky. That's a good way to think about it. I mean, I do love it because then when it's potted, I can sit right next to it on my patio, but uh, yeah, it can be really cranky. Um, and then pruning citrus is not something we have to do a lot of. So I just want to take have, take a second to look at that picture. Um, light pruning can be done any time of year, but the best time to prune citrus is really early spring, after danger of frost has passed, before the start of spring growth. Those things, those suckers, we want those to go anytime you see them. Ideally, as soon as you see them. Um, if you see that sort of swollen line, that that this is a mature tree showing you the graft um, bud union and anything coming out under that um, should go. Trees that have experienced stress, hard pruning, um, neglect, uh, not enough water, that kind of thing, are more likely to see those suckers and they could appear any time of the year. So it's always worth keeping an eye on um, the bottom even of a large plant and look for those suckers. But the foliage of a citrus tree is in a really important food storage area. So when you prune it, you're taking sort of stored food and you cause the tree to produce a flush of vegetative growth instead of fruit. That's not really what you want because you, even if all you want to do is look at the fruit, I'm sure you want the fruit. Um, but also that flush of growth can attract some pests, something I'm going to circle back to and talk about again. So oftentimes we're pruning out only dead or broken limbs or when we found some other cult cultural situation that we need to fix. Um, but those suckers, um, they really should go whenever you see them. Um, bigger shoots that grow from the branches called water sprouts, 
I'm just going to show you what those look like. Sometimes they look like this. They're coming off a horizontal bridge and they're real thick and they've gone really fast. And sometimes they look a little bit like those guys. Sometimes you need to take them off. Um, and sometimes like the ones on the right, I would honestly leave them because they are going to help the tree create um, more energy. But sometimes those big ones, those get wild and you need to prune them back or prune them off. Potted citruses, you know, in its round shape is probably going to come pretty close to the bottom of the pot. Um, but when you leave citrus trees alone in the ground, you really are going to get this round shape and it's the, the uh, tree's almost going to have like a skirt of foliage that extends all the way to the ground. I mean, almost, it's not usually touching the ground. Um, and um, that sort of that round canopy really keeps the trunk out of the sun and the, and the branches out of the sun and um, keeps them from exposure, which is why you don't always have to paint um, your, um, your citrus branches like you would a stone fruit tree, for example. Um, but um, sometimes, sometimes you do. Um, lemons usually need a bit more pruning than other types of citrus. They just tend to be like slightly vigorous growing so if you get something that's wild and crazy um most trees they say you can take as much as 30 percent at one time citrus cannot handle that 10 to 20 percent honestly 10 percent let's stick with 10 percent so if you have a potted citrus and you have it's maybe it's a meyer lemon and you've got one branch that's going off wacky kind of decide what your outer limit is and and give it a tiny haircut um, because it gets harder to do the bigger it is all right, now here's a pop quiz. Um, here is a tiny potted citrus. Um, what is the blue arrow? What is the blue arrow? I only mentioned this word once this time in this presentation. Yes, it is the scion. It is the desirable variety of tree, whatever it is that you want. So if it's Meyer lemon, that's the Meyer lemon. Um, the green line is the thing that changes from sort of a horizontal to often a more, or from a diagonal to more of a horizontal line as the tree grows. This one that you can still see is a bit of a change. We call that the bud union. And if that is the bud union, now I want to know from you, what does the red arrow represent? Oh, look, you guys are paying attention. Awesome. Yes, that's a sucker. Um, and we would want that to go. That is rootstock, and you don't actually want that rootstock. To, uh, to take over your tree. The rootstock tends to be very vigorous when it grows, so uh, it can surprise you how fast and how big it can get. So good job, guys. Just for review for everybody else. There we go. All right. Okay, now most of you have citrus already, and I'm pretty sure this is the section you came to hear about. Um, because citrus is so easy to grow in our environment. And it's, it's really e a lot easier when you know when to recognize a small problem that needs your attention and when there's a problem that's just gonna fix itself if you're patient. So I'm gonna cover those. And here comes pop quiz question number two. What happened to this tree? I would love to hear what you think is going on here. In the meantime, I'm gonna take a, a, a gander at some of the questions that have popped up. Mm, 
All right. I love some of those answers. I'm going to keep an eye on it while I talk about this one. Um, I totally agree, um, George, though. We need to get rid of that ground cover. I think it's not in focus, but I, I think it might be oxalis, which we definitely don't want to have hanging around. Um, but whatever it is, I'm not thrilled with it. And I would much prefer to see under that tree um, some mulch away from the trunk, but keeping everything else away from the bottom of that tree. I also think it'll be way easier to clean underneath that tree um, if it was uh, cleaner. So this is actually <laughs> kind of a trick question. This picture was taken of this tree in early February. It was winter. So there's actually nothing wrong with this tree, um, but when the average temperature is under about 50 degrees, the tree can't uptake nitrogen or nutrition to keep the leaves dark green. So it's really common for them to yellow up in late winter before the temperatures warm up, and then they will just change. Um, so the chances are really great that this tree will green up um, as the weather warms with no intervention. But here we are having this presentation mid-April. If you have a tree that's still yellowish like this today, then it probably does need fertilizer. Um, use a citrus and avocado fertilizer. You want to really apply it to the drip line of the tree. Think about that last picture I sent you. Um, for a mature tree in the ground, you're going to need a few pounds. Um, you can find calculators um, to be more precise about it online based on the size of your tree. Um, for a young tree, a pound or so of the most common fertilizers is plenty. Um, you know, potted trees, very similar. You might fertilize your tree um, as early as Valentine's Day, depending on when the weather warms up. Most so often we have this like week in February where things come alive and things get warm for a couple of days and everything's in bloom and you know our citrus can usually take some fertilizer right about then and then to do it two more times in the spring but you want to think about wrapping up all fertilizing by around the fourth of july and i'm going to explain why again in a, in a couple slides up um, and then don't go crazy more is not better too much nitrogen can encourage a lot of new growth that attracts pests it can have a negative effect on the thickness of your fruit rind um, there can be other complications. So um, citrus needs some, but uh, particularly if we want the fruit from it, but um, don't go crazy. And now I clicked on something. So, okay. And then when we're talking about fertilizing potted citrus, this is totally, this is a little bit different. Um, some of the nutrition is going to be lost out of the bottom of the pot when you water. So you kind of need to water like a, uh, and fertilize just a little bit every couple weeks. Um, if you hand water, you might want to use a granular type fertilizer. So a little bit is released every time you water. If you water with drip irrigation, you might not even get enough at the surface to sort of wet that granular fertilizer and make it useful. Um, so you might want to hand water um, after you put some down, um, just that one time when you're trying to wash that in, or mix your fertilizer in some water. I use an old watering can that has like no um, uh, little um, rain head on it anymore, and you can make a little slurry um, and then kind of add that to the pot. Um, you can also mix it up in the top layer of dirt or compost or, you know, under the drippers, that kind of thing. So just consider the possibility that your potted citrus is and it's being a little more dramatic, we'll also need a little bit of fertilizer multiple times compared to a tree in the ground. And there's that picture again. Um, I bring it back because see those yellow tips? Yeah, that's something else we need. Oops, and then I accidentally, uh, all right, what I meant to say was those kinds of drippers, I love them and I wanna encourage them but they aren't necessarily going to be enough to activate that fertilizer. So if you're going to use um, 0.5 gallon per hour drippers, um, I would consider the slurry or other options to um, keep them fertilized. And then here's just sort of a picture in general, um, you know, what a healthy leaf looks like, what nitrogen deficiency looks like. It usually looks like yellow all over. Um, and nitrogen is the primary nutrient that citrus needs. Um, but there are a few other things. Um, so let's talk about this one. All citrus trees are capable of needing iron, but man, potted citrus usually needs this more than once um, in a summer. So these micronutrient deficiencies, they're really common in California. It's iron, zinc, sometimes manganese. 
Um, they show up as yellowing between the veins on new growth. Magnesium is not usually a problem and Epsom salts can actually be harmful because it's still salt. Um, so that, that one's a garden myth, but use fertilizer meant for citrus and then add iron or an iron zinc combo as necessary. Um, I, you can do it as a foliar spray, the, the, um, the uh, iron, um, but I often find it's just as, you know, it, it's just as effective and just as fast um, for a small tree for it to be, um, you know, put in my watering procedures. Okay. Then we've got weather to contend with. Um, unlike some other fruit trees, citrus knows exactly how many fruit they can support all in the room they're going to typically drop 90% of their flowers without starting fruit. And then they're gonna drop some of those teeny tiny fruits as well. You usually notice the debris on the ground after windy spring weather, but that is not damage to the tree. That's normal. Citrus says, I can't support this much. I'm gonna drop this. Um, so don't panic about that because that's a non-issue. Um, but wild fluctuations of weather temperatures, um, cold rain, lots of wind can split developing fruit. It doesn't happen every year, um, but if poor weather is predicted um, and you've got fruit that's almost ripe, um, I would recommend just taking it off the tree. That's the best solution to the problem. But frost and freeze, they happen. We didn't have really that much to contend with this winter. We did have many nights with frost, but they were very dry, which did not have the same effect on our plants. Um, but in general, if you hear a frost or freeze warning um, uh, on the news or see it on your weather app, you wanna think about your citrus trees. Um, you wanna take small trees and pots inside, put them in the garage, put them in your shed anywhere, um, put them under um, a gazebo if you've got a solid top type gazebo. Put a sheet or a frost blanket uh, over a tomato cage or use poles. You want to surround your tree and let ice form on the covering if that's what's going to happen, not the tree foliage. And if it touches the tree foliage, especially if it's wet, it won't help. And we don't recommend plastic for this particular application. Um, and you see in the bottom picture, you see some lights. Um, old fashioned incandescent Christmas lights can actually provide some warmth for the tree. Um, and so if you have some hanging around and you're not, you didn't recycle them yet, um, that um, I keep a couple in the shed just, just in case. Um, that's a great uh, last use for them. And if frost damage happens, um, and it could happen, remove any of your damaged fruit as soon as possible. Leaving, on, leaving it on the tree will reduce the fruit set for the following season and then wait several months before pruning off other damaged parts. The greater the damage, the longer you should wait. Sometimes branches you thought were dead will produce new leaves. If limbs and trunk are exposed in warm weather um, after you know they had some frost damage, that's when you might wanna whitewash them. Um, and if you don't wanna look at white paint on your trunk, I totally understand. If you check out the nursery whitewash products right now, many of them have a brown tint, which makes them effectively invisible. So I wanted to show you a, a picture. Um, the bottom left-hand side is frost damaged citrus. Um, and then the picture on the top right is what frost damage can look like, particularly on the on the new newer growth for the tree. Um, don't panic and please leave it alone because any pruning could actually make things worse. Um, and then if you live in these sort of extremes of the county where you might experience more frost, um, you wanna give greater consideration to what type of um, citrus you pick. Um, this is by no means a complete list, but here's an idea. Citron being sort of in category, the least cold tolerant tree and kumquat being the greatest. Um, you saw the sort of temperature range where they said this is where you should protect um, on the Four Winds website and be, be, get to know the varieties you choose. And if you live in the South County or something like that, um, think more carefully about um, how you can protect a, a tree um, 
sometimes we need to protect it right sort of at that 32 to 4, 34, and sometimes we don't need to worry about it. And so we've had a couple nights that are, you know, 25, um, depending on where we are. And if, and again, the the um, the possibility of cold rain, for example, and um, a wet piece of fruit um, when it freezes kind of makes the damage a little worse, which is why we had multiple frost nights this winter and not a whole lot of damage. And then our favorite friends, they love to sample our citrus. Rats, raccoons, squirrels, skunks, they will all come and eat some of our fruit. If you see hollowed out fruit like this, that's totally the work of a vertebrate pressed. You really can't avoid it completely, but uh, fruit that is rotting on the ground under the tree really attracts them. So if you can keep that part cleaned up, um, life will be better. Besides that, I'm sure we've all had that moment where we had a lemon that we left under a tree until it was green and fuzzy and you really wished you could have picked it up a little sooner. So, you know, um, that's always a good plan. Keep things clean. Snails, they also come and nibble. Um, depending on how long they've been at a fruit, it can look awfully similar to the um, rat kind of eating, um, but just less volume. And you would think that snails would only be eating the fruit on the ground, near the ground, but in helping a friend last year, I did find a snail that had gone all the way up a full size Meyer lemon tree. It was way up in the branches and eaten to its heart's content. So um, keep an eye out for them. Um, look at night. If you see something nibbling on your fruit, um, particularly if it's still on the tree because the vertebrates that are coming will often knock the fruit off in the process of eating it, um, take a look. If, you're the, if the bottom of your tree is actually really making contact with the ground, um, maybe give it a little bit of pruning so that doesn't happen. Um, you can put boards or something underneath the tree um, where you might then trap snails and slugs and you can hand pick them. You can wrap the trunk with copper. Um, and if necessary, you can use um, something like sluggo, the iron phosphate kind of control. But since you can't put that in the tree, that's really kind of last resort. Then aphids. Mm, we've had a bumper crop of aphids already this spring, um, this mild winter. Um, so probably everyone is seeing some of these in their tree. Um, the aphids that are in citrus are usually pale green or blackish. They're usually found on the underside of the leaves and particularly on the new growth. So look at the ends of your branches. Um, they can cause new leaves to curl as they grow. They do tend to disappear when hot weather comes, um, in part because the hungry beneficials end up finding them. So uh, the first strategy for dealing with aphids is to hit them with your hose, a strong stream of water and knock as many of them as you can off. Um, you can repeat that every couple of days. Aphids can't fly. So um, that's fairly effective. Wherever they go on the ground, they're not gonna hurt your tree anymore, um, but it gives the beneficials the best chance of sticking around. Um, and so what I have as a picture here is what you can see right there, that little alligator looking bug that's orange and black, that is, that's a ladybug larva, and they are a great predator of aphids. So they are doing their job right there. And that small picture, um, those are aphids that have been parasitized by a small wasp. And again, another beneficial. So a strong stream of water isn't necessarily going to knock these beneficials out um, while solving your problem. So that's in everybody's best interest. And then there's sooty mold fungus. And sooty mold grows in the honeydew that's excreted by those sucking insects like aphids. So you often see the two together, including the sooty mold on top and you flip the leaf over and there's aphids or something underneath it. Sooty mold is not harmful in itself, but it does decrease the ability of the tree to photosynthesize. So it deprives of it some nutrition. Most of the time people really hate the way it looks. Um, a strong stream of water can wash this fungus off too and make things nice and clean. If you find them in just one spot, you can also, or you know, small, something that you can control, um, you can take some rubbing alcohol on like a cotton pad like you use for like your face and wipe the leaves off on both sides. 
if you see a lot of sooty mold on your tree, you might want to think about pruning it lightly because you might have an airflow problem um, around the tree. So um, that's that's really the only time that we might um, um, recommend pruning like late summer um, if uh, if you're still noticing it. But aphids are not the only honeydew excreting insects. We also have a number of scales, um, and this is not all of the scale. Most of the soft scales, like the brown soft scale, you see that they're ugly. They, you know, cause some damage, but they won't kill a tree. The armored scales, um, those are those are those have the potential to do more damage. The citrus mealybug, right there, um, that's another one we see all the time. And again, all of these. Oftentimes you notice the sooty mold on the top of the leaf and then you flip it over and you go, oh, look at that. So scale insects insert like a straw-like mouth part into the plants and they suck all the fluid out. Um, you might find them on the leaf, you might find them on the fruit, you might find them on the bark. Um, the mealybugs are sort of segmented insects. They have like a white or gray like wax on them. Um, and then another one, another scale you might want to look for is um, cottony cushion scale. And they look like white sticky clusters, like uh, almost like you know, you'll find an old like spider's nest or something, you know, where like spiders were clearly making multiple nests in the corner of a shed. It kind of looks like that on a small scale. So um, all of those deal with them the same way. Um, try a strong stream of water, um, wash off all of that. Um, and then um, and then we have a few other options for targeting them. But the biggest issue sometimes aren't just those things, but the ants, because the ants are farming those things and they're providing protection for those. So, um, and they protect them from the, the natural enemies of, of um, aphids, for example. So if you control for ants, you're gonna have a better chance of controlling these pests. So check out how the ants are getting on your tree. Um, are they getting to it because you have a branch that's touching a building or that's touching the soil or something like that? And then once you've addressed those obvious things, it could just be a little bit of pruning to fix things. Um, then put something like Tanglefoot um, or something similar around the tree uh, as a moat to keep the ants off. You don't apply it directly to the bark. Um, kind of really gross and sticky, but um, make a ring of tape of fabric tree wrap. Um, Duct tape works just fine, um, about six inches wide, and put the tangle foot in the middle. Um, this gives you the option of cutting that off and reapplying um, at some point if you need to do it like in the following year. Um, but it also, it's not great to apply it to the bark of really young trees or trees that have been severely pruned because there may be phytotox phytotoxic effects. Um, but mostly, I just say don't do it in general because it's it's really unattractive um, and won't wash off the bark. And so you might want to just sort of make a clean application um, in the spring the next year if you find that you're dealing with it again. If you've tried all of those things and then you still need more support to get rid of your um, insect problem, then you can use horticultural oil to reduce the population of the pests, the aphids, whatever is creating the honeydew. Um, but horticultural oil, you have to be really careful. You can't use it when the temperature is 85 or above. It will burn the leaves. It you know, attracts dust, things like that. You'll end up having to wash it off. So kind of a last resort when we add, get into summer um, as a way of dealing with the problem. And then citrus leaf miners. Um, <laughs> leaf miners cause damage that's mostly cosmetic, but those of you with patio trees, you're gonna feel more strongly than that. Um, it's a really small moth. You won't notice it, um, but the nearly invisible eggs that get laid on the underside of leaves, they turn into larvae, they go in between the tissues of the leaf, so they can't be touched by pest control methods. There's just nothing once they're in the leaf. You usually recognize the little maze-like marks on the leaf, and then in the last stage, the thing curls the edge of a leaf around itself for protection. Leaf miners are attracted to new tender growth. So 
This is why I want you to remember, wrap up that fertilizing around the 4th of July for all of your citrus, pot it or in the ground to give that new growth that's gonna pop up a chance to harden off. Those dark, glossy kinds of leaves um, that have been on the tree for a while, the leaf miners, they don't find it so easy to get in. So peak timing for leaf miners is August and September locally. So um, that's sort of where if you cut off that, uh, uh, if you don't prune and you cut off your fertilizer by the 4th of July, then hopefully by the time they show up around the end of August, um, your tree has a better chance of fighting them off. If you have a tree in the ground, you probably will not unless you like studied it, notice the damage. But if you have a patio tree, you're probably going to notice it a lot when you sit next to the tree. So mature trees can totally handle this pest. Um, even mature small trees, it just looks ugly. So um, yeah, so, you know, that's, um, that's the way to deal with it. Prevent it in the first place. So that's just sort of an example of how the leaves sort of curl up at the edge. So that is not a leaf that is dry. That's one that's got a leaf miner in it. Um, there are, you know, other things um, that mimic that kind of damage, but um, look up close because um, you'll probably see those little mazes. And then this guy, you might recognize him as a Katie Dead. Um, oops. Um, again, potted citrus. This is the greater concern. Um, this is a pest you are not going to notice on a big tree, but in one week, they can completely defoliate a small patio tree. And of course, they look exactly like a citrus leaf, don't they? So your best pest control here is no joke. Sneak up, sneak up on them with pruning shears or scissors. Like, they can see your shadow, so be careful. Um, most of the time, <laughs> um, when I'm watering uh, is when I'll keep an eye out and I'll see like a flash of green or some oddly moving leaf um, while I'm hand watering my citrus. Sometimes in the summer, um, particularly last year when I was washing all of the like ash off my little trees, I noticed it because they reacted to the water and that's how I caught them. Um, in my experience, they have not been kind enough to lay their eggs on a leaf. They defoliate an entire branch and then lay their eggs on that. So these guys and me do not get along. Um, but there isn't, they are fast moving and there's not really a way to get them except to catch them in the act. Um, and then sometimes you might see this, you're more likely to see this on a big tree um, where you don't notice, but if you see this kind of weird um, nibbling and it's not snails, it could possibly be grasshoppers, but most of the time this appears on a big tree and it's really just nothing. I just wanted you to know what it looks like so you can say, oh, I don't really need to worry about this. No big deal. Pull the leaf off if you want to, if it really bothers you, but it's not going to hurt anything. But this guy, I want you to recognize this guy. This is, this is important. The Asian citrus psyllid, this thing is the size of an aphid. It's less than an eighth of an inch long. It has this odd posture that what you're seeing in this picture when it's feeding. It feeds on all varieties of citrus and some related plants like curry leaf plants um, and orange jessamine. This psyllid can spread a very destructive bacterial disease. Huang Long Bing or citrus greening disease. You might have heard about this on the news a little bit. Um, a psyllid that feeds on an infected plant by sucking its juices can pass the disease onto other plants when it feeds on them. There is no cure for the disease and it can kill a mature citrus tree in five years. The psyllid came, first came to the U.S. in Florida in 1998. By 2001, it was all over Florida and Texas. It was first discovered in 2008 in San Diego, and we have it locally. So um, about a dozen cases of Huang Lung Bing have been detected in California, and it's growing um, already this spring. One was in a backyard citrus tree in LA County, most probably started from a graft done by a homeowner from an infected tree, um, and then it spread 20 miles away. So um, the stakes are really high on this one. I want you to see, now that you've seen him up close, how hard he might actually be to find on your tree, 
even a patio tree. He's really small. Okay. This is what the psyllid feeding on the tree looks like. You might not see anywhere near this much damage until things are way out of control. But that waxy sort of substance, um, if you see that, that is um, a clue we need to look for psyllids. Um, the nymphs create these wax, they call them waxy tubules to facilitate moving the um, sticky sugary stuff away from their bodies. So I'm gonna, show you a close-up of what that looks like there. Um, and then here's the, the, the disease. The symptoms of the disease manifest one to two years after the infection. Um, it starts with yellowing in one area of the canopy of the tree, and then it kind of goes yellowing some areas of the leaf while other areas remain green. There's misshapen fruit, there's colors distortions. It's now a reasonable assumption that if one tree with HLB is found, all the trees within five miles are likely infected. Um, the stakes are really high. It's probably too late to stop the progression of the disease, but even slowing it down, because we're careful, um, buys the experts time to look for solutions. But like I said, we've been looking for this since it was first down in Florida. So things are not looking great. And before COVID, I would have to explain really hard what the concept of quarantine is here, but I know I don't have to anymore. We all have an idea about this. So um, most of us are in the quarantine area for um, HLB and for this psyllid. So the rules of the quarantine go like this. Do not move citrus plants or grass into our area from areas outside the quarantine including other states, overseas, without declaring or having them inspected. As a homeowner, you don't really have the option to do that. That's why we say go to the nursery and buy, you know, reputable um, plants that have been inspected before they're released to the public. Um, and I know the temptation may be great because we may be running into that situation where you can't find the variety of citrus you want here and you're thinking maybe I'll just drive somewhere else because this nursery in the Central Valley has a whole bunch of them. Please don't do that. Please don't do that because we're not supposed to move trees from there to here without them being inspected. If you desperately want to do that, ask a local nursery to order something for you if they can find it from somewhere else. Um, because they can be inspected before it's for sale. So um, this is this is just super important because this could be devastating. Um, if we have backyard trees with HLB, we could be looking at the Department of Agriculture confiscating and taking out our trees, like burning them, just to make darn sure we don't spread this thing. So um, we do have a responsibility to um, follow the rules of the quarantine, to encourage other people, get them informed and encourage them to follow the quarantine. Um, and Master Gardeners really want to hear to help you. So if you have any concerns about HLB beyond today, I really want you to contact the help desk. Um, we want it to be something else as much as you. So send us your pictures and we'll look for the other cultural possibilities. But if you really, you know, saw that waxy, psyllid stuff, we really want to know about it. Um, and then, of course, um, there's always this question about, um, well, what about the fruit? You can totally share fruit from your tree with your friends, neighbors, um, take it on a picnic, take it on a camping trip. Just remove all the leaves and stems before you transport them. So um, this is the um, this is the current quarantine um, limits. Um, LA's quarantine area was just expanded. Um, this hasn't been updated since 2016. The possibility is great that it will be updated this year or somewhere in the near future. It's not super specific. Um, the pictures of the um, quarantine do line up with streets, but I haven't found a map where that totally lines up. And I've already come into situations where somebody asked me if they were in the quarantine or not along that sort of uh, eastern side of 101. And I actually don't know. Um, it would be really great. Um, and I have suggested that maybe we need um, one overlaid with Google Maps that we could um, interact with. But um, that's, that's sort of what we got for now. 
Um, and uh, there are other quarantine zones. It's just this one, you can move citrus around within the quarantine zone, um, but um, you probably wanna look for a nursery with inside the zone if we're gonna be responsible, okay? So Morgan Hill is not really part of that zone and stuff. So, um, you know, those are the sort of the considerations we might have, because sometimes we go to nurseries that are a little bit farther away from home. All right, so I just, you know, I appreciate um, <laughs> my being able to be on a soapbox about this one because I really want to make sure that um, all of us that are enjoying our citrus can continue to enjoy it in the future. And I'm optimistic that we will find some solutions to, um, to this one. But the quarantine also actually recommends uh, that you take um, any pruning cuts that you take from your citrus and don't put them in your compost, put them in your trash. Um, so that's just, that's just one last thing. Um, and then of course, there are many more things, so many more things. And I just wanna bring your attention to the, some of the pests that I talked about today and some of the easy ways you can find answers for yourself. Um, if you are looking up citrus leaf miner and you would like to find really helpful, reliable information, you can always use the phrase pest note and you will get um, the UC information about citrus leaf miners. Um, and uh, the UC IPM or integrated pest management, which says, let's use the most effective and least harmful to the environment options first. So that's where strong stream of water before trying anything else fits in. Um, there's a lot more information there on um, some of the things you might um, run into. So um, I just want to introduce that. And then I would really like to hear what questions you have. I see that the chat has been very busy um, while I was talking. And um, Jill, if you would like to. Oh, um, yes. I got a bunch of <laughs> Why don't you throw them at me? Okay, um, let's start with um, fertilizing. Yes. For trees in the ground and those in containers, when would you start and when would you stop fertilizing? So I'll admit, sometimes I don't think about it um, until the end of March. So that, that would include this year. So I didn't do it till the end of March, which is totally fine. Um, do it when it starts to warm up. When you start thinking, oh, won't it be great to have a garden in the spring? That's a perfectly fine time to do it. But some people like to say, they like to have something to remember. So you could say something like, hey, after Valentine's Day, that would be a good time to start. Would you do that for both um, in the ground and in containers? Yes. I just and would give the citrus and containers just a little bit less and know that just because I put the fertilizer there doesn't mean that they are necessarily going to like green. It's not an immediate process. Um, sometimes when you put iron in liquid form in the ground, the next day you come out and you're like, oh, look at that. I fixed my tree. It's not always like that with fertilizer. So, okay. Would you, so you say, say end of February, March, and you would go through August or? Fourth of July. Fourth of July. Okay. And by the 4th of July. So oftentimes in the ground, it's just two or three times. You could literally do it. You could say, I'm going to do it February and then I'm going to do it in June and I'm done. Or you could do a little bit, um, you know, as you go. Sometimes if you see, if you, if you gave it fertilizer in February, March, and in May, you're like, gee, I still see yellow chips on that thing, you know, then yeah, I, I give it a little bit more fertilizer at that point. Okay. Now, what if you have some citrus in containers and you're thinking of putting them in the ground? When would be a good time? Is there anything you should be concerned about if you're moving those citrus from containers? So um, every move is a little bit of stress. Your tree has gotten used to being in a container if it's been in a container for a while. Um, I would make a move to repot it and just make sure that it hasn't become root bound. If you have been if you've had the citrus in a pot for, you know, eight years and you repot it every two, just stick it in the ground, just like you had just bought it as a nursery tree. Um, if your tree's heavy, though, which it can be after eight years in a pot, um, consider um, asking a friend to help because the, the more you can support the tree, um, 
the less likely you are to knock off flowers or fruit developing or something, you know, early on. Um, another question with regards to planting in the ground in our clay soil. Uh, one of our attendees did a, a two foot hole and filled it with water and that water is still going down. It's been two days. Ah, okay. So we call this the bathtub effect. Um, and it's complicated um, as a fix. Um, so in generally what people try to do to fix the bathtub effect, meaning you put the water in, it just kind of sits there, um, is to amend the soil with um, something else. And what the research indicates is that that actually makes it worse. So the water flows from the amended soil to this border of the amended soil and the native soil. And, um, and then it just sort of sticks there. Um, it might depend a little bit on how big the tree is, but in general, there are two things that you can do. You can plant the tree a little higher. So um, you can um, add some soil, mix in amended soil, um, but plant the tree higher relative to whatever ground level is. So the water might stop at a certain point in ground level, but the tree's roots um, have a chance of sort of um, getting dry thanks to gravity. Um, beyond more specifics, um, I think this is a, that is a great question for the help desk um, for um, other things you might be able to try. But I think in general, this also sometimes applies to some California natives that are particular about getting their feet wet, like Ceanothus and, and um, stuff. But they, they, if you can plant it above ground just a little bit, so you're mounting things up a little, um, you can keep them out of the, the um, water but you don't want to amend the hole and you definitely want to make sure because amendment can make the tree sink after you've planted it but you want to make sure that does not have an opportunity to happen so um you know make your bound and kind of tap it down and then cut your hole out of it okay let's go back to fertilizing uh -huh. uh, we have one where the tree is about 14 years old the oranges it was planted by the prior owner. Um, they're not sweet. Um, could it be they need to fertilize better or water better? Or do you think we got some rootstock taken over? And <sighs> There's so many, it's tricky. It's, um, if they knew what variety of orange they have, that would be worth checking into um, because then you could check sort of the Four Winds website, right? When they say, you know, how much is it, how much is heat a factor in whether or not the fruit gets sweet? Oftentimes, um, with and oranges, and seem that that question comes up for oranges more than anything else. Um, but um, sometimes the variety of orange it looks orange, and it looks like you ought to be able to pick it, and it feels like it, you know, you know, when you squeeze it, it feels like it's got a little juice, but actually that variety of orange isn't going to be sweet for two or three more months. So the first thing I might do, honestly, is just try it again a month later, two months later, three months later, see if it's improved or not. Then I would consider that perhaps I have under fertilized. Um, and then after that, I would start wondering if indeed, like, the health of the tree is in question. How old is the tree? Did the tree experience any neglect somewhere in there? And sometimes the answer is, I just don't like the taste of this orange. And I really like to have an orange tree that tastes good. So take it out and plant a known variety, you know, of an age and all of the details that you know, and then control for the best practices going in. Okay, um, person with the leaf miner um, yes. and fertilizing and afraid to fertilize. <laughs> um, can you control that? There are there are like traps that you can put on your tree um, that are supposed to catch the you know the actual the, like leaf miner that leaves the eggs. Um, 
they simply know that they're, they let you know that they're present. Um, the eggs are quite small. They let you know they're present so that you can look for the eggs, but you know, for that one, it's, it's really tough. The, there seems to be that there's just every year, there's a lot of leaf miners and most of the time, actually, sometimes people don't go out and notice the damage. The damage has occurred actually at the end of September, but people didn't notice it until spring, but it's not actually new damage in the spring. Um, peak season is really August and September. So um, total eradication of leaf miner or leaf miner damage is probably unrealistic unless the tree is growing 100% of the time in a greenhouse. This question I kind of know with regards to like say apple trees and so forth, but with citrus trees, newly planted citrus trees, should you remove the blossoms the first year? Should you expect fruit the first year? Good questions. Okay. Nope. You don't have to worry about the blossoms. The tree is going to let go as many as it needs to let go. Enjoy their fragrance. Oh, they smell so good. So I just let them continue to blow all over my patio and enjoy that um, heady first smell of spring. Um, but um, yes, you will not necessarily get, depending on the age of the tree, you will not necessarily get um, fruit right away. Unlike stone fruit, you don't have to worry about um, removing any tree uh, fruit that develops after you've planted your tree. The tree is only going to raise what it can support. Um, but for example, um, blood oranges will often take a little bit longer. Lemons, you might get something in the first year. Bears, limes will be, you'll get a little bit the first year, a little bit more the next year. Four years in, you're likely to have a fabulous crop and you can look forward to having a fabulous crop. Um, then on, there are a couple categories of um, mandarins. You know, of course, all of these things are really hybrids. Um, there are a couple categories where they have a tendency to be um, alternate years. So you'll have a really good crop one year and then a slightly lighter crop the next year. Um, but um, yeah, um, for sure. I think blood oranges seem to take a little bit longer. Um, the tree has to mature a little bit more, but the tree will take care of what it can raise. Um, it's more about, I guess, adjusting your expectations for, um, for what you're going to get. My Meyer lemon last year is still, it's still quite small. Um, and it's just a couple years old and I think it made six lemons last spring um, under a lot of neglect because I was busy doing other things in the middle of spring of the pandemic. So, um, you know, that was it being neglected. Um, meanwhile, my friend's Meyer lemon that I was taking, um, <laughs> I didn't really have a problem with that because I got two shopping bags of lemons in one week off her tree. So um, the size of the tree is gonna matter. Patio trees are never gonna quite make um, the same volume, um, even at, even, even if they're the same size as a tree in the ground. So. We have a, um, a let's see, a two-year-old grapefruit tree. Mm -hmm. the ground, no fruit. I'm not super, I'm not totally surprised by that. Um, <laughs> Grapefruit is one of those, you know, hybrid things. Um, and I would say, um, as long as you know where it came from and um, you are not neglecting the tree, continue to fertilize and give it, give it a chance, give it a chance to get going. Um, it, it sometimes takes a little while. Oh, and I did see, um, I did see a sort of a um, comment from George about his blood orange being the worst offender for overfruiting and branch break. Um, yeah, so uh, I've had the same situation where um, it is possible, like I had to support one branch while it was making three blood oranges. And then as soon as I took the oranges off and they were delicious and it was three of the four oranges they made that year. Um, then I was able to stop supporting that branch. But um, yes, 
Um, that can happen, um, but I, it seems to happen more likely with very small trees and potted trees versus trees in the ground. They tend to support themselves better. You talked about um, foliar spray. Mm -hmm. I think that was your favorite. You'd rather do a slow release. It's just so much more of a pain in the butt. <laughs> It's a pain to set it all up, to mix it all up, to put it, you want a sprayer devoted to it because you definitely don't want a sprayer that you put some sort of weed killer in, right, in the, in the last iteration. Um, and flushing a, a, a pump sprayer um, is just, you know, and, and being 100% sure. It's just, yeah, it's just a pain. Um, but if somebody was to have a big citrus tree and they're very concerned about the um, iron situation or they just want more immediate re results, um, the foliar spray is fine. I swear, if I have a tree and it's kind of thirsty and I give it liquid iron in the pot, like just water it usual, but, but give it iron, it's usually, I'm noticing the effects like next day. It's already greening back up again. Um, but um, for a bigger tree, it could take longer. So this one, I think, is kind of what you were just talking about, a three-year-old um, uh, clementine mandarin, mm -hmm. light green leaves that are cup-shaped, they fertilized it in February. Uh, the tree is about 2.5 feet tall. Mm -hmm. Would that be the iron that's needed or? Um... If it's all over yellow at the tips or it's all over yellow or all over yellow like at the tips. So the tips look like they got dipped in bleach then it's still a fertilizer issue. Um, if you have solid green veins and then everything else looks a little yellow around the edges, then I'm more likely to assume that iron is the next thing. Because they mentioned their leaves were cupped. Mm -hmm. And that could be, uh, it, so I've seen a little bit more of that like look in, um, and I would definitely encourage somebody who's growing something that's less common to go take a look at Emma Prush because I think I've seen a little bit more of where the leaf, the leaf shape is more like, like this than just like flat lemon leaves. Um, flat, the lemon leaves are sort of flat and sometimes floppy without actually curling. They're just sort of, you know, floppy like this. Um, and I've seen them cupped a little bit more um, when it was um, a satsuma or a mandarin, one of those varieties. Um, but if it, a lot, then I still start wondering if the tree is quite thirsty. Um, so if it's in the ground and not in a pot, I would go, honestly, I'd, being gentle, I would go and explore and see what's going on um, underneath the ground. Because the other possibility, and this is the part about gardening that I know is frustrating for some people who, you know, just want to have an answer, is that overwatering citrus can also create yellowness in the leaves. So if you go, oh my gosh, I've underwatered my tree and you throw a lot more water at it, it just seems to get worse, then I would go exploring in the soil underneath it and see if that water really isn't draining away. Um, and I got a couple of questions. Coffee grounds, can they put coffee grounds in their soil? Um, there is no <laughs> the re there is research on that now. There is no benefit to coffee grounds in the soil. The tree is not going to care about a small amount of coffee grounds. The citrus trees don't really care about a lot of acid. They're not um, like gardenias or um, something like that that are really acid loving. Um, what we what we know in smaller, less woody plants is that um, the residual caffeine in coffee um, can actually stunt their growth. So it turns out coffee grounds can be um, a great weed preventer um, around established plants, but citrus really won't care. If there's a lot of coffee grounds, it might actually care, but not in a good way. So the individual with the, the, the um, tree in the ground and the yeah. cup leaves, where you said to like explore the ground, um, yep. They're wondering, should they just move the tree? No, no, I wouldn't do that. And I don't expect anybody to be an expert on this. I would say go exploring to see what the soil looks like. Take some pictures of the tree, what you find, say four to six inches underground, somewhere around where the drip line of the tree would be. 
and take those pictures and that background information to the help desk because, you know, um, I think uh, a couple other, you know, two or three people are working help desk every day. So there would be other people's eyes on it. And I think that some sort of consensus would probably be appreciated by whomever is dealing with that. Okay. Alfalfa pellets, what do you think about using them as fertilizer? Uh, go for it. There are a number of master gardeners that actually prefer to use alfalfa pellets. Um, go for it. It's kind of hard to do with a potted tree, but um, again, you can sort of break them up a little bit in the water and, and make a slurry with that as well. Um, one person, if you could type your question again, because the questions are so many coming through. Um, and I'm just looking at them based on the number that are similar. Um, you said I skipped over your question. Um, mm -hmm. Can you shape trees? Can you shape trees, citrus trees? Uh, you shouldn't need to. If they're in the ground, they have a tendency to make a nice round shape all by themselves within five years. Um, but some trees, more blood orange, um, lemon in a pot where you need to keep them smaller than they think they might like to be, um, sometimes need a little nibble. Um, about Bonfonte Gardens, though? What was that? Bonfonte Gardens, uh, Gilroy. Uh, who yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, and you notice, you know, they don't have, um, they don't have a whole lot of citrus that they mess with there outside yeah. of lemon in part because lemon can tolerate it where some other varieties, you know, cannot. Um, and I want to respond to the message about slow release fertilizer on the packaging for every six weeks. Nope. The leaf miner concern is much greater. So whatever you're doing, um, I would do it before the 4th of July. Okay. Some, someone asked, can you increase the yield on your tree? Moderate fertilizing, consistent watering that adjusts for the time of year so the tree experiences less stress when it is hot um, really helps. We have this new thing we have to think about um, in the summer. Um, you might need to wash your tree off with water if it is covered with ash, because if it is covered with ash, that is going to reduce the photosynthesis. That's about all you can do. Okay. Um, the question is, they have a two-year-old tree in a barrel. Mm-hmm. And it is just dropping the leaves. The new mm. growth is a lot less. And they did fertilize in February. And it's a wine barrel, half size. Okay, so it's in a fairly decent sized pot and it's dropping its leaves. I would love to hear what the help desk has to say about that and show some pictures because it could matter where the leaves are falling Sometimes a tree just says, I experienced some stress and I'm going to drop these leaves and they grow back within the same season. Um, when I say potted citrus can be dramatic, that is one of the things it can do. Um, and I have had my Meyer lemon drop a number of leaves for no good reason a couple times. And usually by the end of the summer, they were filled back in again. So I wouldn't necessarily panic, but I would I would also, you know, love to hear what um, others had to say in the help desk. Oh, I just want to mention, I believe in May, and I just posted our, our UC Master Gardener website. Mm -hmm. In May, we're having a plant clinic. Oh, yes. So, yes, um, let's you can that plant take clinic. pictures of your uh, your tree and give the age and the type and your issues, send it in and they will answer them and talk to you directly. Yes, their priority are, are questions and pictures that they can get in advance um, that they can ask you then the follow up questions as needed before they go to present and um, you, and, oh, it's, it's just a great way to get more information on all gardening in general, but for sure a lot of questions come up about citrus, yeah. Okay, if the rootstock takes over, can you kill that out of your tree? So 
if the rootstock takes over, if you have suckers to take over, yes, it can absolutely take over. Um, I recently learned because it, you know, that in, sometimes it is possible to rescue them. In our initial training, we learned that the rootstock was allowed to take over. That was it. Treat, then done. The sooner you move on, the better. Um, but occasionally we notice a sucker at the bottom and it's gotten quite substantial and you can prune it out and then you continue to monitor to make sure that does not happen again. Um, sometimes it is possible um, to save uh, the variety and certainly I would think that is worth trying, um, particularly for the varieties that are more expensive expensive um like yuzu but i also know that you know some um i would not assume that it's rootstock just because it has vicious thorns as maya says because yuzu can really just have vicious thorns um and uh, and that is normal it's it's the where it comes up um that is of the greatest concern okay we have one where they think they have this webbing on the tree and it looks like spiders. Uh-huh, yes. And it probably is. Um, it's sort of like sooty mold tends to, we tend to see more of it in a tree that maybe just isn't getting like proper airflow. And that can happen when a tree is right up next to like fence and a building and just there's not a lot of airflow. And then it's really sort of filled itself in, become too dense. We see the same thing with spider mites. Um, I've got a new trick for spider mites. Um, you're not gonna find this in a pest note, but it really isn't gonna hurt the tree. Um, you can buy like the hand sanitizer spray that's sort of rubbing alcohol that's between 70 and 80%. And you can spray it where the spider mites are, where you're seeing that webbing and then wipe it off or spray it off at that point. Oftentimes you can't just strong stream of water, um, all that webbing off, but the alcohol seems to break it down a little bit and get rid of the, the spider mites. And you just have to, you have to repeat the process, um, either wiping it off or spraying it off multiple times until, uh, until they're gone. Um, does it just have to be grafted? Uh, if you want rootstock, no. <laughs> Um, but all of the citrus that we buy in nurseries has been grafted um, to, um, to address, for example, um, one, of the, uh, one of the diseases in the soil that we worry about now, um, rough lemon cannot fight off. And that is why we no longer use that as root, rootstock. I do not remember which one it is, um, but... Um, the rootstock is, besides controlling for size, there are a number of soil diseases that, that that grafting process is the reason why citrus is so carefree and so easy to grow and so many other trees or fruit trees are not. So that's all running out of time. Um, ah, yes, we are. I just noticed that. Yep, yep. If you like, but yeah, we're going to have to wrap up. Uh, but remember, uh, everyone, that uh, yes, the Master Gardeners do have a help desk, uh, so they're happy to take questions uh, through email, through chat. I, I believe, through, I forget if it's um, other ways there are. There's so many different ways you guys offer it on the website, I've seen. Yep. Do we have a one last question, Joe, or do you think we pretty much covered it? I think that's it. All right. Okay. Um, well, uh, remember, everyone, uh, if you could please fill out our program survey. We really appreciate your feedback. Um, I sent you the link in the chat as well as in the email with the uh, link to attend this program tonight. Uh, thank you so much, Pamela. Thank you so much, Jill. Uh, I know that many have enjoyed this program. And um, again, uh, we will be sending out the link uh, probably tomorrow um, of where the um, video uh, will be uploaded with the uh, recording that we did today. Great. Okay. Great. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you.